Chapter 22. The whole tribe must speak Mandarin. I need to make a pot. After eating fish, Han Cheng, holding a snowball made into a porcelain-like lump, sighed again while gnawing. Not to mention making fish soup to drink, just boiling some hot water would be nice. Unlike now, every sip I take is like an icy path from my mouth to my stomach. All the warmth painstakingly accumulated is gone, not a bit left. It's just bone chilling, not a bit uplifting. I need to make a... In this primitive era, living in a tribe that relied on fishing and hunting, there were too many things Han Cheng wanted to make. However, the bitter cold outside and the ice and snow blocked many of his ideas. He could only stay in the cave and do things that were within his abilities. With ample food, the atmosphere in the tribe had relaxed again. Now, Han Cheng had an additional task. Take advantage of the people's leisure time to teach them Mandarin. This decision was inspired by the gloves incident and became Han Cheng's resolution. The language in the tribe wasn't systematic, extremely simple, and only consisted of some daily expressions. Slightly more complex meanings had to be communicated through speaking and gesturing, which took a long time. Even then, it didn't guarantee the other person understood your meaning. Han Cheng's thinking had been limited in the past. Because subconsciously, he believed that as an outsider, he needed to adapt to the local customs, and naturally, he should learn the tribal language. It wasn't until the appearance of gloves that he had a sudden realization. Yes, he possessed an extremely rich language and corresponding writing system. Why not teach these languages and writing to everyone instead of learning the almost primitive language of the tribe? Especially after witnessing shaman painstakingly recording things on a slate, contemplating and creating a new vocabulary to describe the making process, usage, and names of the newly appeared gloves and socks. After pulling out even more hair from his already sparse head, this further solidified Han Cheng's idea of teaching the tribe to speak Mandarin and write Chinese characters. The first two characters he taught shaman were Shotao, gloves. Taking the stone pen from the shaman, with the shaman's surprised expression, Han Cheng wrote the characters for gloves on a blank slate. Then, pointing at these two characters and raising the gloves in his left hand, he said, Shou Tao. Shaman, being an intelligent member of the tribe, quickly understood Han Cheng's meaning. He realized that these two square things referred to gloves. Although the pattern was extremely strange, significantly different from the characters he usually wrote, and it was impossible to see the shape of gloves from them, the shaman didn't find it difficult to accept. Since these were new things, just like gloves, it was natural that they didn't resemble anything familiar. Shou Tao, he followed Han Cheng's pronunciation and repeated the Mandarin words with clear intonation. Han Cheng handed the stone pen to Shaman, indicating for him to write these two characters. Shaman had had never encountered this strange writing before, but because of his frequent writing, his attempt looked quite decent. Although it was a bit awkward at the beginning, with stiff wrists and inconsistent spacing and lengths of strokes, he could still recognize that these two characters represented gloves. Good. Han Cheng praised in the tribal language and gave a thumbs up to the shaman. Shaman looked at the two characters, Han Cheng wrote, square and neat, and then at the two characters he wrote, uneven and twisted. Hearing Han Cheng's praise, he couldn't help but smile, shake his head, and bend down again. Following Han Cheng's example, he carefully and earnestly wrote stroke by stroke. A person with a cultural background writes differently. After practicing about six or seven times, Shaman wrote the characters for Shotao in a decent manner, and he could now independently write them without looking at what Han Cheng wrote, silently recalling them. This surprised Han Cheng. From Shaman's exceptionally quick reception of new knowledge, Han Cheng became confident in his idea of teaching and spreading the Chinese language and characters to the people in the tribe. Hand Seeing that Shaman had already mastered the Shou Tao characters, Han Cheng pointed to the character Shou and pronounced it. Then, he pointed to his hand, telling Shaman that this character represented Hand. Shaman expressed surprise because the pronunciation of Hand in the tribal language was completely different. He seemed hesitant, unsure whether to learn this new character and pronunciation because it conflicted with something existing in the tribe. 
Han Cheng roughly understood Wu's thoughts, so he naturally brought up the banner of the heavenly god. He pointed to the sky in the totem pole not far away, saying, Heavenly God, speak. Shaman was moved. He did not expect this was the heavenly god's language and characters. After Han Cheng draped the glory of the heavenly god over Chinese characters and Mandarin, Shaman immediately lost his resistance. After all, this was the language and characters of the gods. He had never received the guidance of the heavenly god in his lifetime, and now the heavenly god had sent a divine child to teach him the language and characters of the gods. How could he not study them well? So, Shaman's enthusiasm for learning Chinese characters was aroused. On the first day, he learned to write the characters for Shotao and read and write more direct words in Mandarin Chinese characters, such as foot, leg, head, etc. Education should start from childhood. Having been educated from childhood for more than ten years, Han Cheng, who had never forgotten this principle, not only remembered it, but also put it into action. In the name of the ethereal god, telling Shaman that the god said to pass on the language and characters of the gods to the world, let everyone speak the language of the gods and use the characters of the gods, Wu began to understand the magic and simplicity of the characters and language of the gods. Shaman, who had only studied for three or four days and knew only a few dozen characters of the gods, had already experienced the benefits of the characters and language of the gods. In the past, he lacked the corresponding language when he wanted to express something. Now, he could use the language of the gods to speak. In the past, the characters he inherited and created had many readings that did not correspond to them, belonging to the kind that could only be understood and not transmitted by words. This kind of thing is difficult to teach to others, and sometimes only the creator knows its meaning. Now, with the characters and language of the gods, there is no need to worry about this problem, because the characters and language of the gods are standardized. Chapter 23. Education should start from young. After Han Cheng and Shaman confirmed this matter, they summoned the elder brother, the tribe leader. The three of them discussed and devised a plan together. The elder brother was also curious about the language and writing of the gods, but his enthusiasm was far less than that of Shaman. After all, his main responsibility was not to pass on words, but to lead the tribe in fishing and hunting, ensuring there was enough food for the tribe. When Han Cheng conveyed the idea that education should start from childhood using the language of the tribe along with gestures, the underage members of the tribe suffered. In the past, they didn't have much to do, especially in winter. They would eat until full, play until tired, sleep, wake up, and play again. If they got hungry, they would wait for the next meal. Now, things were different, because they needed to learn the language and writing of the gods from the god's child. There were many underage members in the tribe, nearly thirty-five, which was almost as many as the adults in the tribe. If we included Han Cheng, who had an adult mindset, but a child's body, it was unclear where he belonged. Among the thirty-five, excluding those still breastfeeding, those who had just learned to walk, those still babbling, and those still in a state of confusion, there were only eighteen children of the right age, and this included three who were close to adulthood. Previously, they hadn't carefully counted the number of people in the tribe. After this count, Han Cheng was somewhat shocked. He discovered a serious problem. The number of underage tribe members showed a decreasing trend with age. Although there were occasional fluctuations, the overall trend remained unchanged. For example, currently, there are roughly 17 children aged 0 to 5, while there are only 18 between the ages of 5 and 13 or 14. When he first noticed this phenomenon, he was silent for a moment. Soon, he understood that they weren't in an era of worry-free clothing and food, with advanced medical and health conditions like in his original world. It was a primitive age, and the high infant mortality rate was the reason for this occurrence. Putting aside this complex emotion, Han Cheng focused on teaching Mandarin and Chinese characters. After all, he wasn't a real divine child. He was just an ordinary person from the future who had crossed over without special abilities. There were many things he wanted to do, but without knowing where to start, he could only work on things within his capabilities. 
gradually changing the tribe and creating better living conditions for himself and the tribe. Eighteen underage members were learning Mandarin and Chinese characters from Han Cheng. Yes, you read it right. Han Cheng had gathered all the children of the right age in the cave. Han Cheng approached their education similarly to the shaman, starting with the gloves and socks they were familiar with, and then moving on to body parts like the mouth, nose, teeth, and feet. Tools for writing in the cave were limited, which was a problem. Before this, writing was solely the shaman's task, and others didn't think much about it. If they followed the shaman's approach of providing each child with a large slate and allowing them to carve on it with suitable stones, it would be impractical. Finding slate in the snowy wilderness in winter was unrealistic. Moreover, they were learning words, not recording knowledge on the slate for future generations like the shaman. So using a slate seemed a bit extravagant. Of course, another crucial reason was that writing on slate could only be done once and wasn't easily erased, making it inconvenient for multiple uses. This didn't trouble Han Cheng too much. After years of burning in the cave, a thick layer of powdery ash had accumulated. Han Cheng had someone mark out 18 one-foot square boxes on a flat area and then filled each box with powdered ash. He used a tree branch as a makeshift pen, smoothie, g it over the ash, creating a surface to write on. After writing, one only needed to wipe the surface with the pen held horizontally, and it would be ready for more writing. Of course, this writing tool had its drawbacks. If someone sneezed near it, the ash would immediately fly around. Originally, Han Cheng wanted to make a sand tray, but since winter, the sand was frozen and not easily obtainable. Therefore, he had to make do with this ashtray for now. Fortunately, in this primitive age, having any writing tool was considered excellent. Who cared about so many details? Look at Shaman, for instance. After using the ashtray Han Cheng created, he immediately appreciated its usefulness and had one made in his dwelling. He would take a tree branch and write on it whenever he had nothing to do. After all, in the past few days, he had used up a large slate, learning the language of the gods with Han Cheng. Han Cheng didn't use the ashtray. He didn't deliberately want to be special. Rather, the ashtray could only be placed on the ground. Everyone had to gather around and stretch their necks to see the characters, which was inconvenient. He wrote on a stone slate placed upright in front of everyone. Instead of using a stone pen, he selected incompletely burned charcoal from the ash heap to write on it. Although his hands would be covered in black ash after each writing, and he needed to clean them with snow, the advantage lay in the clear characters. Additionally, wiping the stone slate with snow and animal hide made it reusable, which was more convenient. Children in the tribe needed to recognize words, write them, and learn the language of the gods. Other adult members of the tribe weren't exempt from Han Cheng's teachings either. Considering that they needed to work and didn't have much time to spend on learning, and their adaptability wasn't as strong as the children's, Han Cheng didn't force them to learn to write. Writing could be based on personal interest, but learning Mandarin was mandatory for everyone, with no exceptions. Yes, everyone had to speak Mandarin. Because this decision was made by Shaman, Han Cheng, and the elder brother who served as the leader, even though many people found it troublesome, they didn't dare to disobey. Especially when they heard that this language was the language of the gods, any resistance diminished. As for Han Cheng, after breaking the ice to catch fish and saving the tribe from danger, making gloves and socks to reduce the cold for everyone, especially after being given the title of divine child by the shaman, no one in the tribe dared to look down on him. So during the teaching process, there weren't any incidents of students challenging the teacher. As for lazy children who didn't study properly, Han Cheng had ways to deal with them. For example, making them write the words they had been taught a hundred times. This was enough to correct their habit of slacking off. Of course, Han Cheng hadn't taught them to count to a hundred yet, but he had a solution. He found a hundred small bones in the cave and made a pile. After writing a word, he would pick up a bone from the ground and put it back on the animal hide. As for cheating, Han Cheng, who had received education for over a decade, naturally could think of countermeasures.
When someone was punished, there would be someone supervising nearby. Those who knew but didn't report to him will need to write together with the cheater, and each act of cheating meant adding another hundred characters. Chapter 24 The tribe's name is Green Sparrow, Rabbit. Han Cheng pointed to the two black characters on the stone tablet, gestured to the rabbit elder brother had brought back today, and began to pronounce, Rabbit, Rabbit, Rabbit. After some time, the children, who had become accustomed to this routine, followed Han Cheng in repeating it three times. Energetic and loud, they already had a bit of the appearance of elementary school students in later generations. Achoo! A floating little feather took advantage of Han Cheng inhaling and slipped into his nostrils. He couldn't help but let out a loud sneeze. Then, then, the cave resounded with three synchronized sneezes. Achoo, achoo, achoo. Seeing these students earnestly learning, Han Cheng couldn't help but feel speechless. This scene was quite common in the cave, and people no longer find it strange. The current situation in the cave was that those making gloves and socks were sitting together, doing their work while watching the divine child teaching the children the language and writing of the gods. They also occasionally followed along and learned a few sentences. Of course, most didn't learn from divine child, but rather from their children. After learning the language of the gods, they would pass it on to their elders and relatives. This was a task assigned to these children by Han Cheng. In this way, these children could consolidate what they had learned and reduce Han Cheng's burden, preventing him from having to do everything himself. People are different, and everyone has their preferences and strengths. Just talking about recognizing characters, the one who learned the fastest and best wasn't the seemingly agile elder brother's son, Haywak Baby, but a boy named Stone, who was only about five or six years old. He is the youngest son of junior brother, Sandy. Each time new characters were taught, it didn't take long for Stone to read and write them accurately, and his pronunciation was very authentic. This made Han Cheng feel like he was teaching not primitive people, but modern elementary school students. Of course, it wasn't the kind of elementary school students who were good at playing mobile games. Han Cheng's education was far from being as strict as in later generations. They could do their things as long as they learned what he taught. Therefore, Stone became an object of envy for many people. With punishment and Stone setting an example on the side, the other children noticeably accelerated their learning. Of course, Han Cheng knew the principle of being too greedy and not chewing well. He only taught five characters daily, commonly used Chinese characters, totaling just over 3,000. Teaching all of them wouldn't be too difficult. Han Cheng gave Stone and Heiwa names based on some of their characteristics. For example, Heiwa was dark-skinned, and Stone looked sturdy, like a little stone. Now, Han Cheng finally knew the name of the tribe. This was something he found out after carefully observing the totem pole. On the totem pole, the most prominent figure was a somewhat abstract bird, which also looked like a chicken. This was the god worshipped by the tribe. Knowing the truth, Han Cheng couldn't help but shed tears. He couldn't help but twitch his face when he realized that the god he had been waving the big flag for was either a bird or a chicken. Now that he was called the Divine Son, what had he become? Birdman? Eggman? Chicken Man? Egg? He must change the name. After discovering the truth, Han Cheng immediately made up his mind to change the name of the tribe's totem pole. Even if he didn't want to involve himself personally, just being referred to as the Bird Tribe or Chicken Tribe by the tribe was enough to make Han Cheng uncomfortable. After much thought, without changing the tribe's totem, Han Cheng decided to rename it to Green Sparrow. Although fundamentally still a bird, it sounded much more high-end than just a bird or chicken, at least several dozen floors higher. The totem in the tribe was a bird, which was evident not only from the bird-shaped image on the totem pole, but also from the fact that men, women, and children in the tribe liked to decorate their hair with collected beautiful feathers. As the weather gradually warmed up, when Han Cheng taught the tribe students to count from one to a hundred, the snow outside had completely melted. The ice in the river had also melted a lot. Han Cheng specifically instructed them not to go on the ice to catch fish to prevent any accidents. 
With more melting ice and more places for fish to breathe, it was no longer as easy as in winter to spearfish effortlessly. But there was no need to worry about the tribe's food supply, because over the winter, the cave had stored a lot of fish, to the point that some had already spoiled and needed to be discarded. And with the thawing of ice and snow and the arrival of spring, Elder Brother and the others could go hunting again. With the supplement of meat, the importance of fish, which was not as delicious as meat in relative terms, wasn't as significant as in winter. As the weather warmed up, small grasses emerged from the clumps of dry grass, peeking out with their yellow and thin heads, mischievously observing the world. The trees, silent throughout the winter, sprouted buds. Some eager ones even bloomed. The entire world seemed to come alive all at once. The happiest were the children who had spent the winter in the cave. They were like young foals let out of their pens, leaping and jumping around in joy. Laughter echoed in the woods in front of the cave. Of course, for safety reasons, they couldn't run too far and were limited to the area in front of the cave. But that was enough to make them happy. Shaman would sometimes come out, basking in the sun, too. With the increase in meat consumption, salt accumulation in their bodies increased, and everyone's stamina had somewhat recovered. However, eating salt directly would have been better, but Elder Brother and the others didn't know what salt was. Also, due to his young age, Han Cheng couldn't travel with the hunting party to different places, so the matter of salt had to be temporarily set aside until later. Nevertheless, Han Cheng was still very happy, not only because he could step outside the cave and breathe fresh air freely, but also because he could finally do something he had imagined many times before. Pottery. Yes, pottery. It was difficult to sip hot water at this time. Whether bronze, iron, or aluminum, they were all non-existent. The quickest way for Han Cheng to have hot water was to make pottery. Whether it was a pottery bowl, basin, jar, or some oddly shaped pottery, as long as it was pottery and could hold water, Han Cheng dared to put it over the fire to boil water. After witnessing the horrifying infant mortality rate in the tribe, Han Cheng felt it was necessary to make pottery and promote drinking boiled water throughout the tribe. Even just the ability to kill parasite eggs would be enough. Chapter 25 Face That Was Struck by Lightning Early in the morning today, Han Cheng had already gotten up and had breakfast, and after Elder Brother and the hunters went hunting, Han Cheng announced the news of giving a day off to the children in the cave. At first, they were a bit skeptical, wondering if they had misheard. The divine child, who had always been strict with their requirements, suddenly announced that they didn't have to learn the divine language and language today. When they confirmed that the divine child wasn't joking, but meant it, they couldn't help but cheer and rejoice. Watching these cheering little primitive people, Han Cheng recalled the scene when he was in school, and the whole class cheered when the teacher announced a two-day break due to continuous heavy rain. He smiled at these children, truly understanding their joy. After the cheers of these children subsided, Han Cheng pointed a few times in the crowd and said, Heiwa, Tito Ironhead, Xiaomu, Littlewood, Zhuang, Strong, Xiaomei, Xiaoli, Star, the seven of you come with me. These children's names were, of course, given by Han Cheng. As before, the names had some connection with their characteristics. For example, Tito. This guy could use his head to crack open a walnut-like nut, which amazed Han Cheng. Xiaomu was named because he looked a bit simple-minded, like a piece of wood. Zhuang, because she looked relatively strong. Although she was a girl, Han Cheng gave her such a name. Xiao Mei and Xiao Li were two twin sisters, relatively delicate compared to other primitive people. Han Cheng gave them such names. Xing was also a girl with a younger brother named Cheng, Don. However, Han Cheng did not call him this time due to his young age. Giving names was a necessary thing because before having a name, people in the tribe addressed each other with words like you, me, and him. Apart from Shaman and the elder brother who served as the leader, no one had a special title. Because of this, if you wanted to talk to someone, you generally had to walk up to them face to face, or it was easy to get confused. As students of Han Cheng, these underage people naturally had to be named first. After Han Cheng gave them names, he would also write down the corresponding characters 
and let them firmly remember the pronunciation and writing of their names. And he told them that this represented them. At first, they were not used to it and found it hard to remember. But Han Cheng wasn't worried because before teaching new characters each time, he would go through the names. Anyone who didn't respond with here when their name was called or who answered someone else's name would have to write their name 50 times and call themselves I am XX, 50 times continuously. This was indeed a good method. These children could all remember and write their names in just a few days. Han Cheng called them out because he had a reason, pottery. To be honest, he had never done pottery, but he had seen a video of an old lady from some tribe making pottery using traditional methods. Because the old lady's pottery skills were really good, Han Cheng had a deep impression and remembered quite a bit. As for burning the pottery, he was quite confident. Han Cheng called these seven children to go with him to let them participate in making pottery. They were children in the primitive era, primitive tribe, so they couldn't be like children in later generations, not worrying about anything else and just focusing on studying. Han Cheng wanted to teach them Chinese characters, Mandarin, and various survival or life skills. Of course, there was another reason. Han Cheng couldn't possibly do everything alone. Just like when he taught the people in the tribe to make gloves and socks, now he wanted to teach these children to make pottery. The manpower in the tribe was limited, and these children were among the older ones in the group of underage people. They were already able to do some things, and with them as helpers, it could save a lot of labor for the tribe. Han Cheng brought them to where weapons were stored in the cave, took some weapons that the elder brother didn't take with them, and then walked outside the cave. Carrying weapons for self-defense was necessary because the path from the cave to the small river to the south was not smooth. In between, there was a dense forest with trees of various sizes. Although there weren't too many wild beasts in the vicinity due to the presence of the elder brother, there were still occasional appearances, so precautions had to be taken. Divine child, are you? Lame got up from the ground, inquiring with a touch of respect and curiosity towards Han Cheng. Due to following Han Cheng to bring fish to the tribe during the winter, Lame's status within the tribe had increased quite a bit. He was very grateful to Han Cheng for that. Of course, having tasted the sweetness, whenever Lame saw Han Cheng making something new, he would come over and ask. If possible, he would learn along with him. This included the daily teachings of Chinese characters and Mandarin by Han Cheng. Due to this, Lame unexpectedly became the second adult in the tribe after Shaman who could read and write characters. Among the adults besides Shaman, he spoke Mandarin the best. The small river was not far from the tribe, and it was fine for Lame to follow. After all, among them, there was not a single adult. Although Lame's leg was not convenient, he used to be a man who chased after wild beasts. Even if he couldn't contribute much, having a courageous person was still useful. The sun rose from the east, shining across the mountains and forests. In the middle of the forest was a thin mist, like a white and translucent short skirt for the trees. The nine of them crossed the forest and arrived at the side of the small river. The ice in the river had long since melted, and the water was clear and transparent. Many fishes were swimming in the water, and reaching out was much more agile than in winter. Han Cheng stopped about a dozen feet from the small river and didn't want to go further. It wasn't because the fish in this river had teeth that were more fierce than those in later generations. It was because the river water would reflect his appearance. Han Cheng had always thought that after revealing his true face, the people in the cave would not dislike him and would not treat him as an outsider. This was partly due to his mysterious origin and partly due to the bond formed with the people in the cave after some time. But after the spring arrived, he suddenly discovered that those were all secondary when he washed in the cold water by the river. The most important thing was his current face. This face showed signs of atavism. Although it was only about 30 to 40 percent, it was enough to make Han Cheng feel depressed. After all, he had never thought about plastic surgery. While depressed, Han Cheng couldn't help but marvel at the thunderbolt that fell on him. Not only did he change his body, but he also incidentally gave him a facelift. 
fortunately, there was no sex change. Otherwise, Han Cheng would have found a crooked neck tree and hanged himself from it. Chapter 26 Han Cheng Making Pottery Seeing the fish in the river, Lame was excited, as this marks a turning point in his bleak life. Watching Lame with a tree branch approaching the river, ready to spear the fish inside, Han Cheng stops this enthusiastic fish spearer. Han Cheng instructs the others to clear the grass within a circle of about one meter that he marked. Then, he asks Lame and Hei Hua, wielding versatile pointed tree branches suitable for hunting and fishing, to dig the soil. Unlike ceramics, which require specific types of clay, pottery does not have strict requirements for the type of soil. Pottery was widespread globally in ancient civilizations, while porcelain, a more advanced form, was mainly found in China. Having examined the soil here, Han Cheng knows its stickiness is suitable for making pottery. He chose the riverside instead of near the cave for pottery making because pottery does not require special soil, but it does need water to mix with the clay. Digging a layer of soil, Han Cheng stops the actions of Lam and Hei Hua. He uses tree leaves to scoop water from the river and pour it onto the exposed soil. Then, under the gaze of the onlookers, he kneads the clay. Lame and the seven students who followed him are wide-eyed at this scene. They don't understand why Divine Child has called them out and solemnly ask them to watch him play with mud. Or perhaps is Divine Child trying to teach them how to play with mud? However, everyone has played with mud before. After heavy rain stops, digging mud outside the cave is their favorite activity. Could it be that Divine Child can bring some new tricks to playing with mud? Their minds are full of doubt and confusion, but they watch silently as Divine Child plays with mud out of respect for Divine Child, who often creates useful and novel things. Han Cheng pays no attention to what they might be thinking. He concentrates on shaping the clay into blocks and then takes a block, patting and kneading it into a round cake with a diameter of about 10 centimeters. He places this cake on a stone they picked up on the way which is covered with dry grass to prevent the clay from sticking to it. Then, he takes more clay, rolls it into strips about half a centimeter thick, and wraps them around the edge of the circular clay base on the stone, creating layers until it reaches a height of about five to six centimeters. The onlookers, who are now witnessing the creation of a pottery piece with a small bottom and a large mouth, no longer look down on the process, as they did at the beginning. Divine Child did not call them here just to play with mud. Han Cheng adjusted the barely recognizable bowl-like object, making it look more like a bowl. He then signaled Hei Hua to fetch water from the river using tree leaves. Although the well-prepared clay was not used up, Hei Hua was puzzled about why water was needed. However, he followed the instructions. Han Cheng scooped some water held by Hei Hua and poured it onto the pottery embryo. He carefully smoothed out the rough surface using wet hands, gradually reducing the visible marks. It was a meticulous task that required extra care, but even with the utmost care, Han Cheng, being a novice at this, sometimes left unintended imprints. Nevertheless, after about 30 minutes of effort, a bowl-shaped embryo appeared in front of everyone. Despite its larger base, smaller mouth, uneven height on the left and right sides of the mouth, and an overall asymmetrical shape, it could barely be considered a bowl. After all, considering it was the primitive era, expectations shouldn't be too high. This is what I'm giving you today. We can use it to drink water, hold rice, and even boil eggs. Han Cheng, with muddy hands, improvised a speech. Of course, those learning Mandarin with him for about two months could not fully understand his words, especially phrases like, hold rice, or boil eggs. However, they got the general idea of what Divine Child meant. Even the lame, who respected Divine Child the most, couldn't help but widen his eyes. He couldn't understand how this odd-looking thing made of clay could be used to drink water. After all, anything made of clay would be ruined when it encountered water. Even if it didn't break, the mud would still stick to the mouth, making drinking impossible. How could something made of mud be used to drink water? Han Chang explained excitedly, but when he turned around, he found everyone looking at him and then at the pottery bowl with dumbfounded expressions. Han Chang believed that if it weren't for his divine status and the fact that he had performed many miraculous feats in the past, 
these people would have shown an even more obvious look of bewilderment. What are you looking at? Follow what I just did. Now, everyone starts working, Han Cheng, with a somewhat embarrassed face, snorted, pretending to be angry. Then, he ignored them and continued playing with his clay. Pfft. Someone couldn't hold back their laughter, and soon, laughter echoed. These underage individuals, who had been learning from Divine Child for so long, had never seen the usually calm and seemingly omniscient Divine Child in such an embarrassed state. After the first burst of laughter, the rest couldn't help but join in. A bunch of little bastards laughing at me now. In a few days, I'll show you the skills of the Divine Child. Han Cheng muttered in his heart with some frustration. He habitually touched his nose with his hand, only to realize that his nose had picked up a chunk of clay. Seeing this, the little troublemakers burst into even more laughter, and even Lame on the side couldn't help but laugh, his face red and his neck thickening from holding back the laughter. Despite the laughter, the work that needed to be done had to be done. Since Divine Child wanted them to do it this way, they followed suit. Whether the clay could be used to drink water was not important. The important thing was that it was fun. Especially today, witnessing the usually mysterious and serious Divine Child in such an embarrassed state was worth doing a lot of useless work. Moreover, apart from learning the Divine Language and writing introduced by the Divine Child recently, they didn't have much else to do.